want to bring this theme alive. And we started looking at the book of Nehemiah chapter 1, or maybe from chapter 2, we looked at different aspects of it, and the title was The Challenge to Rise and Build. In that sermon, we looked at the background of the book of Nehemiah, because we were studying the book of Nehemiah, and it was important for us to look at the background. And the background to that book is actually in Jeremiah. How many of you remember that? Jeremiah, we started from uh, chapter 25, coming down what we looked at how the people of Israel were taken into Babylon, right? Because of uh, disobedience and other things, God allowed the Babylonians to come and take them into Babylon for, uh, into exile. They were in there for over 70 years. Daniel prayed and then a return began, right? Through uh, King Cyrus. God stirred his heart and then he started returning the people and they came in three badges. Uh, what was the first badge? Let's do a little class, right? What was the first badge? The first badge was targeted to do what in Jerusalem. So they were coming from Babylon to Jerusalem, and their purpose was what? Who was leading the first badge in the first place? Come on. I know it's been a long time. <laughs> right? The first badge was led by who? All right. There were three badges. First badge by who? Uh, mountain. Yes. Zerubbabel, thank you, brother. Zerubbabel was the one who led the first group. And what was their purpose? To come and do what in Jerusalem? Zerubbabel came to, Zerubbabel came to do what? Rebuild. Uh, before the war, they were rebuilding what? The temple. Amen. They had to rebuild it because the temple had been broken down. Remember, there was war, there was chaos. Everything had been broken. And so when he came, the first was to rebuild the temple, the place of worship. Remember that for the Jewish people, the place of worship was almost like uh, the, 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 um, the common place that they, they gathered for all kinds of activities, not only for worship, even for their social life. Right? And so the building, the temple had to be rebuilt. And he did a good job to try to rebuild it. Then there was a second group which was led by who? Come on, I thought by now you would have referred to your notes. <laughs> the second group was led by who? Ezra. Thank you. And Ezra was what? Ezra was, was, was what, what was his professional, his, his area of assignment? Yes. Yes. He came to reinstitute the, the theology of God, or rather the, the, the worship of God. Right? So the temple has been built, but they must understand what it means to worship in the temple. Are you with me? The God of the temple had to be taught. People must understand the God that they want to worship. Because remember, they have been away for how many years and over? Come on. 70 plus. It means that there were some people who were born in exile. And then they didn't understand what it means to actually worship. The Babylonian uh, way of worship is what perhaps they had, they had grown up to know. Their fathers would do well because every Jewish community, they have to make sure that they follow, they have their own way of life within every community. Are you with me? So these people had to be re-educated on the worship of God and Ezra led that group. Remember that he was also a scribe, right? He was one that could also write a lot. Then the third group is what we are trying to learn from. And it was led by who? Everybody by who? If you don't know this one, then we have to uh, help you much more. <laughs> right? The third group is now led by Nehemiah. And what was his assignment on this group, for this group? What did he come to do? To rebuild the wall. All right? So that was the background. It's necessary for us to catch that background very carefully because it, it, it's the foundation for everything that we are trying to learn. Right? So Three groups of people. Number one is by Zerubbabel rebuilding the temple. Number two, by Ezra rebuilding the worship of God. Right? And then uh, by, uh, the third group is by Nehemiah rebuilding the wall defense. Okay? So that is how we understood. And we said that is the background. Then we asked a question that Nehemiah showed enough care for him to come back to do this work because it took a lot of, of, of courage for him to say, I see the problem and I want to do something about it. So we ask the question, do you care enough to know about what is happening around you or within your community? What is happening with your neighbor? What is happening with people that you must be able to know things that are going on in their lives? Come on, amen. 
We must care enough like Nehemiah did so that we can be able to help when the need arises. Then we came to part two and we looked at the title, Having the Bad Pains to Rise and Build. How many of you remember that? The Bad Pains to Rise and Build. And we talked about uh, six areas of bad pains, like when you are a woman in your, in your, in your season of re- getting ready to give birth, right? In your labor pains, we said that that is how it must have felt for Nehemiah to have this burden in, in his heart to go back and do something about the problems that were going on within his hometown. And then we said that in your bed pains, where well, the first part of the bed pains is that there was a waiting time for Nehemiah to get to where he needed to be on the assignment. Are you with me? When he first heard about the troubles, he didn't just jump and said, I want to go and do something immediately because he had some limitations around him. Number one, he was serving in the king's palace. He was working for somebody. So he needed permission. He couldn't just leave his post and go and do what he needed to do. Are you with me? So that waiting period sometimes can put you on the edge. Have you ever been, I mean, be in a position where you have this passion to do something? And then maybe somebody above you or a superior tells you, wait a little bit. Every time you want to get on it, they say, wait a little bit. And you wonder, why is this person saying, I should wait and wait and wait? Are you with me? And while you are waiting, you are on the edge. You are fidgeting. Every time you get opportunity, you want to get on with it. But there is always a waiting period and there are always good reasons why you must wait a little bit. Come on, amen. And in the waiting, you don't just wait, but Nehemiah taught us that in waiting, we must pray. All right? And he kept on praying and we'll look at that as well. But the next thing was that he maintained honesty and integrity about the facts of the matter. He did not go to God and wait as if there was nothing happening. He wasn't in, uh, in denial of the problem. He was able to identify it and he was honest about it. Number three, he was able to depend on God continually. That is a very, very difficult thing to do sometimes. Depending on God continually. And number four, ass- uh, assessing what is needed for the job was also another painful task that he had to go through. Right? Recognizing God's favor and help was necessary. And then expect opposition was also another thing that he had to face. It was a bad pain, but Nehemiah went through it. Then part three, we talked about <clears throat> praying through the problem. That Nehemiah did not just identify the problem and did nothing about it. He prayed to receive the favor to go, but he also prayed while he was on the job. Throughout the service, throughout the mobilization of people. He was praying consistently. When people came to oppose him, he prayed about the opposition. Come on, amen. So pray through the problem. When you are fixing the issue, don't say, I've got the answer so prayers can wait. But you must be praying while you continue to fix the problem. Amen. While we continue to build in this year, you must learn to pray through your building process. Don't say, I have risen. I've seen a good way to go on this thing and so I don't need the church. I don't need fasting. I don't need prayer. I don't need to come on Wednesdays to pray anymore. I am good to go. No, you must continue in your prayer through the issues and let God help you. When problems come, don't run to other alternative sources. Seek God, the God who led you on the journey. Go back to him and he will help you through it. Come on, amen. So pray. Nehemiah We know that he opened, the book actually opened with prayer from chapter 1. We know that he continued in prayer. He was consistent in his prayer life. Then we also looked at the quality of his prayer. Nehemiah's prayer had a certain quality to it. He was careful to understand what he was praying about. He strengthened himself in prayers. He he supported um, everything about his lifestyle was also supported with his prayers. And it was very, very important for him to do so. Then part four, we looked at what happens when I'm doing what God says I should do. What happens? Because something will come up. Sometimes you will never attract certain uh, 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 problems until you begin to do some things. (laughs) Are you with me? When as so, nobody will bother you if you are in your corner or if you are doing your own thing and you are not staring and you are not rocking anybody's boat, you'll be at peace like how peace can be. <laughs> but the minute you want to make a difference, 
you will find attraction. Somebody will be attracted to what you are doing. Either for the wrong reasons or for the right reasons. Attraction will come. But Nehemiah also had the same issues. So in your endeavor, expect an attack. Something will come to try to rock you up. To try to uh, disturb your progress. And you must be aware of those things. Expect that some things will begin to shake up. And you must be ready for them. Discern the tools the enemy used to attack. Nehemiah also was able to discern these things. So this is one of the things that happens when you are doing the will of God for your life. You must discern the tools the enemy wants to use. What was one of the tools the enemy used against Nehemiah? The first one was what? Yes, ridicule, mockery mockery, to break their resolve so they will not continue, to make them feel inadequate. They, they don't measure up to this job, right? What did they say? Even if a fox ran over this wall, they had just come a little feet up. Even if a fox go over it, it's going to fall. And they mocked with their strength like that. So mockery will aim to break your resolve and your potential. But you must rise above the mockery. Come on, amen. Rise above the mockery and you will do well in Jesus' name. So expect these things and know that it will come around you, but God has given you grace and you overcome. Then part five, we looked at how to deal with the attacks when it comes. Nehemiah responded by what? Everybody? Your notes. Look at your notes. Are you with your notes? <laughs> All right. Nehemiah responded by what? Prayers. He prayed. If you study the, the whole chapter, you, I mean the whole of the book, you would about six or seven different kinds of attack. And every one of them, Nehemiah prayed about them. Every one of them. He would go to God and pray. He would go to God and pray. So he responded in prayer through the problems. Then Nehemiah received, uh, resolved rather, to guard the vision. Remember that at a certain point, he held, everybody was holding a sword in one hand, and then with one hand, they kept building. He was guarding the vision to make sure that nobody will lose sight of what must be accomplished. Come on, amen. I pray that in this year of rise and build, you will not be distracted. The enemy will not come and sway you from your position of focus. That you will be focused until you finish the assignment to the glory of God. Is somebody with me? He resolved to guard the vision. Nehemiah also rested in God. That is how you can deal with an enemy's attack. So you, must, you must understand that the fight is not yours to fight. If it is God that is leading you to do the job, then sometimes you must learn to rest in the power of God to fight for you. Come on, amen. And the Lord will fight for you in Jesus' name. Then we said that Nehemiah didn't only deal with external attacks, but he also has to deal with internal problems in part six. Are you with me? In part six, he dealt with internal problems. And we said that... Um, and in that, we looked at the statements of the problem. And there were a number of them. I've, I've listed all of them. You can look at it later. Um, for example, the first one was that there was farming in the land. And that caused food sh uh, shortage. And the prices of food and everything was going up. Correct? Because of the, of the farming. And Nehemiah had to deal. The people were now complaining. We have no food to eat. We are struggling. And he had to find a way to deal with those internal issues. And we've listed all the problems that were internally going on and how Nehemiah responded to them. Go back to the sermon and you'll hear all the responses and other things that comes with this uh, summary. Are you with me? And then today we want to go on to part seven, right? Which is one dot. And then you have to fill the blanks. <laughs> are you with me? So fill the blanks as we go. Uh, but at a certain point, we'll try to create some more of the summary for you so you can have the full summary by the time we finish. All right. So today we want to look at um, part seven of life's lessons from the book of Nehemiah. Uh, there's an announcement I forgot about Pastor Jeanette's brother's funeral. So we'll talk about that after uh, we finish the sermon. Somebody remind me because there's an arrangement we need to put together. All right. So life's lesson from the book of Nehemiah, part seven, how to handle success. How to handle success. Come on, amen. Somebody will ask, but success is success. It's a good thing. Why must I learn how to handle success? I thought we'll be talking about how to handle failure because failure, you don't want to fail. 
So you must learn to handle failure properly so you don't repeat it. But how do you handle success? Is, is that even necessary? But it's important to understand that life is full of failures and successes. But your ability to manage both will help you to continue in good success all the time. Are you with me? It is important. Now, it sounds familiar to something that uh, Paul told um, the, the, the people of Philippi, right? In Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 to 13, Paul wrote to the church in Philippi saying to them that he had learned, right, how to live with plenty and how to live with little. Are you with me? Because life is not only about living with little all the time. When you have lived with little for some time, sometimes by applying the right principles, you can break through the little lifestyle into a much bigger lifestyle. Are you with me? So when you break through and now become um, a person of influence and you are living with large, how do you then handle the large quantities of stuff that you now have to deal with? Because all your life, maybe you have been living with 10 pounds. So when you want to shop, You look for the cheapest shop around and you go there and shop for the best things that you can find with 10 pounds. Right? One pound shop, uh, pound stretcher. Um, Should I say some more? I know some of you love some shops, so I don't want to step on anybody's toe. (laughs) Right? But, But we all know some of the shops that we go to when money is not very fluid in our pocket. (laughs) Are you with me? And so we are little in that sense. So you buy things and you look for the best that you can find with the little that you have. And you, you, some, some people can master life in such a way that you will not even know that they don't have what it takes to live. Are you with me? Because they've managed to live with little and when they flow with you, they are like normal with everybody. But then, sometimes these same people can be blessed and now they are in plenty, but then they carry the mentality of a little person. So, when they are living with plenty, they still are not able to to, to live like somebody who has plenty. So, they still go to the pound stretcher and want to buy the one pound things that are not very good quality for them. (laughs) But you can live a little much better. Are you with me? You have to learn. There's a way you learn to live with plenty. If you were living with 10 pounds before and now you have double 20, you must learn to live a 20 pound lifestyle a little bit. Right, So, the things that you were buying that were cheap, in two weeks, they are all broken. But now that you have a little bit more money, you can go to a much more expensive shop That can give you a bit more quality. And when you buy it, it lasts you better. And in fact, you save more money by going that way. Are you with me? Because you can go and buy one pound cheap and then two days is gone. But you can buy three pounds more quality and it will last you for a whole year. Have you found that difference? Come on, have you found that difference? And that is the difference. You must learn to live with plenty. Your mind must shift to a whole new lifestyle in order to survive at that place of success. If not, before you know it, you you, you have plenty, but it will not actually be around you. The glory of plenty will not be around you. (laughs) It will not manifest. (laughs) Are you with me? So, we are trying to learn how Nehemiah handled his success. Because right from chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, this guy has been suffering with troubles, right? He came to gather people, they went on the building, then attacks came. All the way to chapter 6, they were still attacking him. Are you with me? They threatened to even kill him through a false prophet. But he still survived all of that. And how did he now was able to handle the success that he attained? Nehemiah was very successful in the end. But how did he handle his success? The good works of Nehemiah made him the choice person as a governor in Judah. Judah is the capital for the southern kingdom of Israel at that time. Remember that after Solomon, the kingdom divided into two. There were 10 tribes that collected themselves to the northern part and then they had their capital to be what? Samaria. Are you with me? And then the, 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 the two tribes down south formed um, by uh, Judah and then Benjamin and they had their capital to be Judah. And so for that group of people, Nehemiah became the governor at a certain point. But he became a governor not out of some, um, some, 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 um, some mere 
you know, work. But he had been working. People had known his work. And because of his good work, God allowed the people to promote him. People who focus on resolving problems and do it well get rewarded eventually. Have you noticed that? That if you focus on a problem, if you decide to be a problem solver in your life, you will end up always also getting the reward that comes with it. I had an interview by, um, on the TV. I think they were interviewing this man who wrote a book about how Jewish people prosper or how they become good businessmen. And he said that one of the things that they do is that they don't go out trying to make profit. No. Their mentality is to look for problems to solve. And they have a hope in them that once they get to solve the problem, people will in turn reward them for what they have been able to solve. And that's how they approach life and business. And so you will never find them trying to make profit and, and hungry for the profit or reward first. But they look for problems, little ones, within their own community. The more they solve problems, the more rewards they get. And that's how they develop businesses. Are you with me? So people who focus like that make profit and they get rewarded for their work. And so I pray that in this season or in this year of rise and build, you will rise to find problems around you. You will rise to provide solutions in your community, in your family, things around you that needs organizing. Sometimes there are people you can find two, five, three or four people within your community that need maybe their garden trimmed. Not to do the whole garden. Sometimes trimming it. And you'll be thinking, if I come to... My, my son Eugene was thinking that way the last time. So I'm giving him permission to go and do the business. <laughs> he will make money. <laughs> right? Trim the gardens and charge them five, five pounds every one hour. And you'll make money. You'll solve their problem. There are people who can't get to the garden. Right? But if you can get there with your energy and help them, you solve a problem for them and they will in turn bless you. They will give you a reward. Without even you having to say, for this work I do, give me five pounds. No, they will give you something. Sometimes your charge is even small than what they are thinking to bless you. Are you with me? So find problems. And out of that, in fact, if you talk to a lot of business people and people that have actually invented things, that is how they invent things. They look for problems and they say, what can I do to solve this problem? Do you know that typewriter? I read it a long time ago in the Word for Today typewriter, this thing that we now have on our mobile phone that we tap, 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 tap. Before, it used to be a whole machine that you have to carry to type and get letters and stuff done. It was somebody, a Christian, who saw his, um, his, his preacher, the pastor, preaching every Sunday with huge and volumes of paper. Every Sunday. The man would carry volumes of pages and come, and then it would be flying everywhere on the pub, and the guy was sitting down in the church. What can I do to make my pastor's work easier? And that is how God gave him that idea to create and come up with this machine that can type things for his pastor. And that is how we all have it now on our mobile phones. Are you with me? So find solutions or find problems and try to provide solutions to them. And you'll be amazed the kind of reward that will come to you. So what drives you in life is a question that I wanted to think about. What drives you? Is it to solve problems or to rather be a burden in life? Come on, amen. What is it that is driving you right now? What is it that is giving you the inspiration to continue to live the way you live? Is it to be a problem solver or a burden maker? <laughs> if there's any phrase like that. Huh? Is it to be one that always wants to be a problem solver? I made a decision a long time ago when I saw that my father had lost his job. I was about 10 or 15 years at the time. And I made a decision. I will never let my mom struggle to take care of all of us. There were three of us. So right from that age, I started working in the church in everywhere. That I, and thank God, do you know that all my school, from secondary school, right, till I finished, people paid for me. My parents didn't have to pay. And I found money because I was serving somewhere. Somebody saw me in the church serving and said, I will sponsor you all the way. If you want to go to university, I'll pay for you. Yes. Are you catching me? Find problems, solve them, and you'll be amazed at the kind of rewards that can come to you. B, I told myself, I, will not, I don't want to be a burden to my parents or my mom. Are you with me? And that is how God blessed and survived and helped us survive, and we went through everything. In due season, people will hear your voice. 
Sometimes it feels like you have been trying to solve one problem, do one thing here, do this here, and, and it's scattered all around. What you must try to find is, am I in the will of God in all of this? If you can be certain that you are in God's will for what you are doing, then don't worry about what people will say or how long it will take or how scattered it seems that you have been. In due season, your voice will rise. Come on, amen. In due season, your work will shine forth and people will come to your brightness in the name of Jesus. Come on, amen. So let problem solving drive you, not the, dr the drive to make wealth quickly. Even if we get wealth and success by pursuing it and it doesn't yield the fulfillment and legacy, we anticipate sometimes it can be very disappointed if you focus on profit and wealth instead of problem solving. You can go and do a lot of things and sometimes you don't get the fulfillment you want. Proverbs 28 verse 20 says this in the NKJV. If it's on the screen, hopefully you catch it. It says... A faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hastens to rich will not go unpunished. It means that there is some discomfort, there is an unpleasant reward that comes with people that want to go shortcutting in life to make wealth. Are you with me? They are hasty to try to make it, so they have no time for people. There are people who love money so much, they will kill people for money. Are you with me? And it's the wrong way to go about life. But if you hasten in that way, you will have an uncomfortable reward. A reward will come to you, but it will be a reward that will help, I mean, that will, that will, that will destroy your life. And it is not going to be helpful for you. Nehemiah did not follow the world's approach to a better life. Instead, he served and fought for what was right and godly. When you look at Nehemiah's approach to life, he did not approach life to try to... Why would he leave the comfort of the palace to go to a place that he had been told is going through suffering, is going through digestion, is going through all kinds of situations? How many of you will leave London by choice and go to some place that is, is, is in difficulty right now? Only a few people will make those choices. There are people who, when they have opportunity to go and visit some war-torn areas in the world. They will say, no, 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 I don't want to go. I'll wait till the war is over. But there are people who would rather jump and embrace the situation. Did you hear the story of the two charity workers who died in, in Israel, in, in Gaza? Was it last month? Did you hear the story? Yeah, they were trying to serve. But unfortunately, a convoy that they were traveling in was mistaken for an enemy's convoy, and they were blasted and died serving a community that was in need, right? So sometimes people make all kinds of choices, but I pray that our approach to life will be to serve and become useful, fight for what is right and godly. All of Nehemiah's struggle, there was nothing there about himself trying to fight for his own reputation or position or trying to own up to what he has been trying to do. He did not end up trying to create his own empire. But he fought consistently, always, to see that the job is done. To see that the people and the land that he came to serve was served properly. Prosperity with integrity comes through adherence to the word of God. When you learn to pay attention to the word of God, you will be like a Nehemiah kind of person. Are you with me? Nehemiah understood the protocols, how he must be able to follow in God's way so that what he was trying to do will always lead to glorify the Lord. In Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, we read this very powerful statement. In Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Not only be successful, but your success will be qualified with the word what? Good. It shall be a good success. It means that people can have success, but not all successes are good success. Are you with me? But the Bible, this is Moses commanding uh, Joshua. And he says, I have been there, my brother or my son. 
the way to survive and become successful at this work. Hear from me. You are taking over from me. I've been here for 40 years already. So here, hear my advice. If you learn to focus on this book, the word of the Lord, focus on it and it says meditate. In other words, keep it in your memories. Have it in your spirit. Let it be the thing that you live for. Let it be the thing that comes out of you when pressure is applied. Let it be the word that comes out of you. And when that is your focus, it says you will have good success. You will prosper in your ways and also have good success. So that is how you survive. That is how you make the way of the Lord prosperous in your ways. Come on, amen. There is a uh, there is significance for the success, for that success, or, oh, sorry, I think I'm jumping my, my notes here. All right. But check your heart is what I want to say rather. Check your heart and your ways and your motivations properly. Because if you are not very careful, you will get along because of the pressure around you. There are so many people that perhaps have gone ahead of you. Maybe some of your colleagues, some of your schoolmates, you have seen them. They are driving better cars. They are living in good homes. They are making more money. And when you look and hear some of the things that are happening around you, your heart will begin to jump as if you are so late and you must catch up. So in your haste to try to catch up, before you know, you are cutting corners, you are in all kinds of things, and they are leading you wrongly. Are you with me, somebody? Come on, are you with me, somebody? It is time to begin to examine your heart properly, and before we go, we'll pray on this issue very seriously, that God will touch our heart, change our heart, helps us to focus on the right things so that we can attain good success to the glory of God. To the glory of God. So, is there a significance for that success that you are trying to achieve? Or is it all about your gains, your image, your comfort, and controls? There are people who want to be successful because they want to control. They want to be in charge. They want to be the boss. They like the idea of people calling them the boss and the one in charge. There are others who, because of their image, their prestige, right, they must get to the top by all means. Because they want to feel important. A lot of politicians do that. <laughs> right? Unfortunately. People come into that space because they want to add to their, to their accolades that they were once upon a time the, the minister of this and that. Or the, the regional this and that. And, and sometimes it's not because they want to serve the community. And you see it all around. <laughs> come on, Amen. You see it all around. And we must be careful not to allow ourselves to be controlled by those kind of motivations. So Nehemiah demonstrated a fine godly character when he got to the height of life. Success could not change him. This is important. Success at rebuilding the walls could not change Nehemiah. Remember that others have been trying to do this work. But he came around with the favor of God upon his life. He finished the work in 52 days, my friends. 52 days. What could take others years, 52 years maybe to finish. But he came by the message and the goodness of God. He was able to finish this job. Who would not brag everywhere they go? <laughs> that I did it in record time. I can imagine if he was a politician today. Oh. <laughs> All right. During COVID, right? I don't know if you notice all the all the flexes that the uh, the nations were flexing. Those, I mean, those who had the power and the and the machinery and the resources to flex. We can build hospitals in few days. China did one. They built a hospital in what? In in one week, a whole full functioning hospital for COVID patients. Check the story. We forgot it, and they were flexing. I remember those days. Our our health secretary. Was it Matt Hancock? <laughs> and when they built, when they finished building um, the, the, the COVID hospital, the one in Excel or something, they finished building, the way he, 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 he leaped for joy in front of the cameras, I remember that image so much. Well, we beat the record. We did it in record time. And they kept drumming it in our ears. We did it in record time. Right? But Nehemiah did not change because of the success he attained. He did not brag about it, but he focused on serving and serving alone to please God. Come on, amen. So we must be warned that only a few people can live in the lap of luxury and maintain their spirituality. When you find people that are lapping, they are in the race when they, they are on the course of luxury, 
right? Sometimes you are in, in poverty, but God blesses you and you come into the lane of, of luxury. It is only a few people who will maintain that lane and still maintain their spirituality. A lot of people will change quickly. I know people who came into this country from Ghana, my home, <laughs> my motherland. Fire in the Holy Spirit. I met some of them when I was working in the shop. They said to me, what are you doing? I was reading my Bible during my break time. And they were laughing. They said, ha, 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 we give you two, two weeks. You'll be like us. We came fire like you. But look at us. <laughs> we go to the pub with our boss. And they said, I'll follow them. I said, you don't know. Everybody have their own strength and stories. Amen. But to the glory of God, I kept my lane. Come on. Come on, amen. So it is only a few people that are able to stay the course. But you must be aware of it. If you are not aware of it, sometimes unconsciously you begin to drift without even knowing. So you may be pointing fingers at others, but maybe you yourself, you have drifted a very far away from the truth and you didn't even know it. Come on, amen. So it is a few people and I pray that High Priest Chapel will be part of the few who are able to stay on the lap of luxury and not change and not run and not change our stories and our testimonies in the name of Jesus. A Scottish historian called Thomas Kyle or Carlyle said this, Adversity is hard on a man, but for one man who can stand prosperity, there are a hundred that will stand adversity. A hundred. You find falling quickly in adversity, but it takes a few, one, to stand when there is good prosperity on their way. So strangely, many people can handle devotion than promotion, if you think about it. There are a lot of people, when it comes to being demoted, they know how to survive with demotion. They know how to handle poverty. They know how to handle little. But when it comes to promotion and plenty and living successful, it is difficult for a lot of people. They quickly change their persona. One pastor said that one of the worst things you can do for church members or church people is to put a title on people. They are all good and nice and serving faithfully until they be, somebody called them bishop. Then they change the way they walk. <laughs> uh, when they come, they want people to hold their Bibles. They want people to say certain things about them. There are certain people, if you introduce them and you don't say some things, you are in trouble. I went to uh, uh, be an MC, only an MC. <laughs> <laughs> at a certain funeral and the list that I had to carry to try to I was, I was fed up. I had not done things like that before. <laughs> come on, amen. And, and people will come and warn me with tears. If you don't mention my pastor's name this way there will be trouble. <laughs> I'm telling you. Are you with me? And it is amazing how people are very soaked and very particular. I appreciate when they say that I worked hard for my, for my doctorate, my PhD. So you must acknowledge that. It's okay. But let it not be the thing that beats you down and so much that you, you get angry when it is not recognized. It's as if without that, you can't live. <laughs> are you with me? Well, uh, I think tonight, oh no, tomorrow we'll be talking about at the leaders' training. <laughs> The, the meaning of the spirit of leadership. We'll talk about that. Come on, amen. So people know how to handle demotion rather than promotion. Success can disturb your balance if you don't take care. And it can lead to pride. Psalms um, 75 from verse 7 to, uh, from 5 to 7 says this. Don't lift your fist. Right? Your fist. In defiance at the heavens or speak with rebellion arrogance for no one on earth from east or west even from the wilderness can raise another person up it is God alone who judges he decides who rise and who falls come on amen God alone so be careful how you how you boast that this thing even God cannot help me even God cannot prevent me the story is always told about the, the captain of the Titanic ship, right? 
and, and, and the certification of the ship was that the guy was so confident in, in, the, in the strength of the ship that, in fact, somebody told me recently in a study that they actually took off some of the lifeboats, right, on the ship because they felt that they would never need it on the high seas. So they dropped it and left it in Scotland. Is that Scotland? It started in Scotland, right, or Ireland, the Titanic. It was sailing from here to New York, right? So they left it here. And they say only for them to go and hit an iceberg that started crumbling the ship. And now, what he said, even God cannot sink this thing, had now become a problem. So be careful how you let your success. They were very successful at building the world's largest and the most sophisticated ship that could ever be built in that time. And they were very good at it. And they, bo they were boastful about it. And he felt that he, he made the statement, even God cannot handle this. But then, it turned out to be the worst case scenario. So let us be careful. Every elevation comes, number one, one of the key things we must take home today. Number one, I'm wrapping up. Every elevation comes with privileges and temptations as well. When you are blessed, it will come with all the favors that you will ever enjoy. It will also come with every temptation that is ever known to man. So you must be careful about both. Are you with me? That's why we started by saying that when you get to want to do something, all of a sudden, there are certain things that your moves will begin to attract. It will attract people that will want to bless you and it will attract people that will want to be a stumbling block. You must be ready to deal with both and know how to handle every part of your elevation. Your elevation will come with privileges and with troubles as well. Nehemiah chapter 5 verse 14, we read, Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year until the 13th, until the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provision. What is he saying? When I became a governor, I had a privilege. The privilege was that you get... Uh, 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 um, uh, the, uh, the king's provisions, you have certain allowances that comes to you. Are you with me? There are benefits and special favors that go with promotion. The wise leader will use them without abusing them. Come on, amen. When you find somebody who is very wise in the way they handle success, they will know how to use those privileges and not to abuse them. They will continue to use the privilege, but they will use it wisely, moderately, in ways that will continue to help them to function and do well with everybody along and not to enjoy and abuse the privileges while other people are suffering all around you. Are we learning something today at all? This is the first thing we must learn from the story of Nehemiah. That when you get promoted, a good way to learn to handle your success is to have this idea that when I am successful, it will attract privileges, it will attract favors, but it will also attract a lot of temptation. A lot of it. A lot of it. A lot of it will come to you. And you must be ready to handle both. Learn from Nehemiah. He understood that even though he had all the privileges that he could enjoy, he said, I didn't enjoy them. I did not go for it. I had plenty that I didn't need to abuse and handle the other privileges that came with my promotion. Are you with me? This is what he was saying. Nehemiah, as a governor, had food allowance for official entertainment. But... He did not take advantage of it. He did not misuse the entertainment allowance. The privileges were at his fingertips, his disposal. He could have used them anyhow he pleases. He could have found his family members and just shower it on them. Are you with me? He could have found people that would just be, 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 uh, be, be, uh, be uh, what do you call it? I'm trying to use a word. That will, that will attend to his beck and call and just shower these things on them. People that were favorable to him, he would try to use these things to also favor them. But Nehemiah didn't do that. I was listening to the news uh, recently, uh, African news. So you know this is from Africa. <laughs> there, there, there was a governor, a governor that is in the news recently in, 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 in one of the countries in Africa is that he managed to use state funds, right? Allowances that have been made for state governments. 
and the management of state resources. He managed to use a lot of it to pay for, pay for his children's school fees. Right? In an international school in Nigeria. <laughs> in an international school. One year in advance. One year. He paid it all. So much that it came out that there were people, state workers, that had not been paid in that same time for over one and a half years. He had not paid them. But yet, he was able to use the same money to pay for his children's school fees. One year in advance. <laughs> dollars, he paid it all in dollars. Five of them. And they said that a term is about $20,000 or something. And he paid in advance one year for five of them. So do the math and you know how much money he was splashing around from the state government. Pure abuse of resource. It was there for him to use, but it was for the people, not for his own pocket and his family. Are you with me? About 14 or so years ago in 2009, this is 15 years ago actually, uh, when, when there was news in this country about MPs and how they, they were mishandling their allowances. You know, they had certain allowances and they could reclaim some money from the government. So they worked for the government and they could claim money back for every expense. Some of them were reported to be claiming on one P, one penny. Are you with me? <laughs> one penny. And you would ask yourself, so can these people not sacrifice one penny for the sake of the community? They will claim it. And they started naming a number of them to shame them. A big scandal. And some of them were falsifying documents. Some of them were going behind back doors. Some of them were living in London and they say they live in their constituency with another second homes. And that's how they changed the rules so that they can now tighten and make sure people claim fairly. And it wasn't too absurd. Are you, are you following what I'm saying? Mismanagement of resources when we are in power. Because success has come. Here in this country still, in the news recently, NHS has been in the news because there are managers that have so much money, it, it was reported in one of the news that there are people who, when they want to sign contracts, they don't even look at the figures. They, they just sign off for, for uh, procurement. They just sign off things without even considering to bargain or check where it could be cheaper for the NHS because the money is there, they just spend it. Are you with me? We must be careful. Sometimes we can point fingers, but be careful that when you are in the same position, you don't repeat the same thing. Are you with me? This is what we are trying to learn. Nehemiah did not let his success change him at all. As children of God, integrity must guard us against taking advantage of unlimited privileges. Sometimes the privilege you have because of the good work you've done, people will trust you. People will honor you. People will give you space to operate without limitations. But you must be careful not to abuse that limitation, uh, that unlimited resource or rather favor. Are you with me? Like David. David, when he had opportunity to serve in King Saul's house, remember that King Saul had a demon or depression uh, frustrating him. And when the, de the depression comes on, it would take a musician to play for, for the depression to calm down. And David was his musician. Are you with me? David played and played and played. But you will never hear in David's story against King Saul. When King Saul was actually targeting to kill him and, and frustrate him. And he never used that disgraceful moment of King Saul to disgrace him. Never. Are you following me? He had privileged information, they call it. Privileged information. To destroy this king and tell the whole of Israel, your king is a madman. <laughs> I was the guy playing for his madness to calm down. But he never used that against King Saul. He kept running away, saving his life, and keeping his cool until God exonerated him. Are you with me? One temptation that comes handy with elevation privileges is the temptation to build your own empire. You'll be tempted. No matter who you are, there will be something that will cross your mind. Why don't I just do my own thing and forget about this whole business of bringing everybody along and trying to work for people? People, people. <laughs> like one guy told me, we went to visit him. You know, apparently he's been to church and he doesn't go anymore. Somebody said I should go and visit and try to pray for him so that he can come back to church. And then we started talking. He goes, Pastor, I hear what you're saying, but I can't stand people, people, people. The way he said it, I thought to myself, but you're also a person. 
Who can stand you? <laughs> Are you with me? I can't stand people. But we must be careful that we don't end up with the wrong example. Nehemiah didn't go trying to build his own empire. We didn't hear Nehemiah building Nehemiah Company and Co. <laughs> or whatever you want to call it. Right? He didn't build his empire to try to make a point. He stayed faithful to the end. He stayed faithful to the work until the job was done to the glory of God. And his reward is that people will still con- preach about his story even till eternity. Are you with me? His conscience asks, am I going to continue the practice or set a good example? Because sometimes people will come and say, you have all the privileges. Why do you bother struggling and living like you don't have what it takes to, to maneuver and get your way out quickly? But he kept on building with integrity. I believe people around him might have told him, the system is like that. The system is like that. It cannot change. So don't try to mess. Don't, don't disturb the system. Everybody comes and when they give a little to the government, they take a little bit more to their pocket. Are you with me? Everybody comes when they want to sign or, or say people came to do work and, and, and they paid 10 pounds, they will write one pound. That's the system. Don't change it. Don't disturb it. People might have told him, but, but the Himaya did not go with that idea. Come on, amen. The next thing that we must try to do um, is to keep doing the right thing as you are doing as you were doing before. Don't change your ways because of success. Keep doing the right thing as you were doing before. Number two, uh, as you climb the ladder of success, make sure you have godly principles that guide you. That's the next thing. Make sure you have godly principles that guide you. So number one, we said that elevation comes with temptations and privileges. Number two, when you are climbing the ladder of success, if you are making notes, please go by this order. As you climb the ladder of success, make sure you have godly principles that guide you, like Nehemiah. Follow your principle. Then number three, keep doing right as you were doing before the blessing. Don't let the blessing corrupt you. Come on, amen. Keep doing the right thing as you were doing before the blessing. Come on, amen. Nehemiah kept on doing the right thing. Let's read Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 16, for example. Indeed, I also continued the work on this wall, and we did not buy any land. All my servants were gathered there for the work. He did not get interested in trying to acquire land even though he was the governor, he could do it. But he kept on building and focusing on the right thing. Nehemiah knew that his task in Jerusalem was to build the walls of the city and he never lost sight of that goal. He kept on building and built to the glory of God in spite of all the temptations that could have come around him. Then number four, understand that you are blessed to be a blessing, not a burden. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Come on, amen. Understand that you are blessed to be what? A blessing. Everybody, you are blessed to be what? And not a burden. So we'll end this point here by saying, the Lord will remember you as you do good unto him. Saving souls and blessing people is supposed to be our DNA, what actually drives us. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, the last scripture. For we are his workmanship, Created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Come on, amen. Don't be a burden because of the blessing. Sometimes when you get blessed and promoted, you now become a burden. The people that were walking around with you and trying to hang around, you say now you don't want to eat with them anymore. But you all used to eat and have fun together, but no more because the blessing is now there. Now my class has been lifted. You are not with me at the same class. So stay in your corner and let me go my way. Very soon you begin to go back because they say, you see, that the same steps, right, when you are climbing a ladder, the same steps that helps you to get up, when you are coming down, you are likely to meet the same ones. You will not fly down. You will have to step on the same ones to come down. So be careful how you step on them when you are going up. Are you with me? Are you with me, everybody? Continue to be 
who you were before the blessing. Don't become a burden. Be a blessing. You are blessed to bless others. Let's rise to our feet and pray that the Lord will help us. The Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Pray and say, Lord, even in my prosperity, let me continue to seek you. On the lap of luxury, let me not change my ways. Let me continue in the same ways that you have led me. So I will give glory to your name in the same. If anything at all, let me be able to give you more glory, more honor in my prosperity than I ever could. Lift up your voice, lift up your hands and tap from the grace of God to help you. Say, Lord, help me, help me, help me. As I rise and build, as I build successfully, as I begin to look for success and I achieve it, Lord, let me continue in the same humility. Let me continue in the same grace of giving. Let me continue in the same grace of the Holy Ghost. Let me be able to live out the fruit of the Spirit. Let me not change and become boastful, pride and in all ways somebody pray you need it you need it you need it in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus temptations everywhere but Lord keep us on the line of, of, of your holiness in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus let the privileges that come let them be able to be managed let me not fall because of temptation in the name of Jesus somebody pray pray for one minute before we take offerings Pray for one minute before we go. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The Lord is helping somebody today. On Zoom, the Lord is helping you today. You will not go away from the way. You will stay focused. You will stay righteous. You will stay with God. You will stay in the fellowship. You will not go out of fellowship because you prospered. The Lord will help us today. Elim City High Press Chapel, the Lord will help us today. As we continue to build in this year, we will build successful things. But we will not leave the Lord alone. We will not leave our place of worship. We will not leave our place of honor. We will not leave our place of prayer. We will not be too busy not to pray. We will not be too busy not to come to fellowship. The Lord will honor us and we will continue to honor the Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord help us to seek you as a precious jewel. Help us to seek you as a precious jewel. Never to give up on the things that we have learned from you. For Paul told Timothy that even as you rise as a young preacher, never forget the things that you have learned from your mother and from your grandmother. Keep on fighting for the truth and stay in the word of truth. For they will guide you. They will guide you and make your way prosperous. Joshua was told by Moses, don't let the book of the Lord depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. Lift up your two hands as I pray for you. Father, today I pray, let the grace that came upon Joshua, that he was able to keep the word of truth, let it come upon us, oh God. Let it come upon Elip City and everybody that is associated with us. Let that grace of Joshua come upon us, that we will stay focused, we will stay focused, we will complete the job, we will not let anger and the things that are around us sway us from the truth. We will stay in the line of righteousness. We will stay in the line of your focus. We will stay in the line of your vision. And we will do well to your glory. Others will come and say that you have come far, but your principles are still intact. It will be said of our children that they have grown in the wisdom of God and have not given up on their God. It will be said of our youth that they grew in the fear of God and they did not turn back on their faith. In the name of the Lord, they will prosper and do well. In Jesus' name. Today I declare that you will prosper in your ways. The Lord will continue to favor you in the name of Jesus. You will conquer the temptations that want to bring you down. You will rise above any kind of things that want to bring you down. In the name of Jesus. May the Lord make your way prosperous on every side. And may he keep you. May he keep you in prosperity. Still faithful. Still faithful to the glory of God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Put your hands together and celebrate the goodness of the Lord. Somebody celebrate, 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 celebrate. The Lord is good on Zoom, on Zoom. Celebrate with us, celebrate with us in the name of Jesus. God, we give you praise. Oh, we thank the Lord for his word. 
I pray that this word will continue to stay with you and help you to prosper and have good success. Good success. We call it good success because you never change from your ways. And the Lord will, if there is any change that you will care, it will be a change for the better. It will be a change that you have, we have been able to do well with God and not to deny him in Jesus' name.